Welcome to Bible study. My name is Bobby Carmen. I hope to get you interested in reading your Bible, your King James Version. I hope to stir your mind up and get you into searching the book of the Bible for yourself. Uh, there's no other person that can do this for you. You'll have to do it for yourself. So that's what I want you to get you a Bible. And don't be afraid to write in it. Don't be afraid to mark in it. And at Bible studies, uh, we ask questions. And uh, we try to answer the questions according to the scripture. And uh, we want everyone to see what the grace gospel is. And the grace gospel is recorded by the Apostle Paul. He is the uh, man that God chose in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts to bring forth the message of grace unto the Gentile people. So all of this book of the Bible that we have today is a, an option that God gave to us in the apostles' day when the twelve were chosen by Jesus. And in Jesus' day, there was only 39 books. Those 39 books that was recorded with what we know as Old Testament well, what these things put into our perspective is that when we read the Old Testament, we see all the prophecy or the speaking of to come uh, from all of the law giver, Moses, and all of the prophets that have added to, like David. David and Solomon added a lot to Moses' law, and Jesus come not to destroy the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill. So that's what we're trying to do is connect what the Apostle Paul was given in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, connect it to what the law and the prophets predicted that should come. And did it come or did it not? Well, according to these scriptures that all forewarn, predestinate, and are in the foreknowledge of God, they certainly did come. And they were fulfilled by Christ himself. Now, the Apostle Paul has an abundance of spiritual revelations. And what he gives in understanding, a lot of people, even the twelve apostles, don't want to accept what he is saying and to change their lives to be converted to grace. They were Jews, and certainly Jesus was a Jew, born under the law at a certain specific time that was prophesied that would come. And these things were set in order by God himself. But when he come uh, in the fullness of time, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, he was born of a woman made under the law. He came to redeem them, Israel, his brethren, all the 12 tribes of Israel. He came to redeem them out from under the law. He came to remove the curse and give them grace. And that was his purpose for coming entirely and wholly. He didn't come for no other uh, thing to do uh, no other purpose to be fulfilled other than to fulfill the law and the prophets. So, as we read and search the scriptures, uh, don't be afraid to write in your Bible. Don't be afraid to search these scriptures uh, in accordance to other scriptures to support uh, what the book says and what I'm saying as far as what grace is. Grace is not a religion. Grace is not a list of commandments of do's and don'ts. Grace is not hanging over your head in which if you make a mistake, God is ready just sitting there to destroy you. No. That's all confusion. That's all perception and it's not right. Jesus Christ came to lift the burden of the law off of the Jews' shoulders. And he did that by not just destroying it or taking it away. He did it in his life of 33 and a half years living under it. 
and he was fulfilling it day in and day out of his life so that when he got to the end of his life, it would end up exactly at the end of the law. After Christ is crucified, the law is to diminish. The law is fulfilled, it's to abolish. It is to wax old and decay, the Apostle Paul said. Uh, so we have to understand the terminology that Paul is using. When something waxes old and decays, you throw it out. If it's food or if whatever it could be in your life that it gets old, like material in pants and shirts or coats, uh, you wash it so many times it gets where just fabric falls apart. There's nothing that holds it together. And you, what do you try to do? Sew a patch on a patch nope. on a patch on a patch? Throw it away. You throw it away. And that's what you do. That's what the law was done with by Christ. He came to fulfill it, to finish it, to abolish it, and his uh, the topping on or the icing on the cake for doing that was that when he was nailed to the cross, the law was nailed there with him, and his blood blotted all of those commandments and ordinances and doctrines out. Pour, pour a quart of blood on your Bible. But you better be ready to get me another Bible because you will not be able to read what's on the pages. Jesus' blood ran out of his side and fell the, to uh, the law and the prophets. All of the 39 books of the Old Testament that gave any uh, indication at all that Christ was coming and what he would do when he got here. But when the blood ran out on it, it was blotted out. You couldn't have seen it. You couldn't have read it. Hanging there under the nail that was had it nailed to his cross. So what we're failing to do is hear good, solid preaching that gets into the message of the cross. We have to bring the message of the cross to the ultimate peak of our knowledge. Without the cross in here, we don't know. It'd be like following somebody on a journey their entire life, but never seeing the promised land. Wonder who did that? Moses did that. Moses did that. Moses was on a journey called and separated by God. And when he come to the end of that journey, because the journey as he knew it, as he would have known it, was not fulfilled. You see, the scripture says uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that Moses had a veil upon his face. He could not see to the end of that which would be abolished. Moses did not enter the promised land. You know, not a lot of people know that. But Moses was forbidden to enter into the promised land. For one thing. Mm -hmm. Disobedience. The first time that the Lord spoke to Moses, he told Moses to smite the rock with his shepherd's staff. So Moses smote the rock and forthwith come water like a river and began to run down over the hillside and run in a valley up through there and all of Israel had plenty of water and so did all of the beasts of the field that they had brought with them. Every animal had plenty of water and water was going everywhere. And what the spiritual revelation of that was, that that rock was Christ. And God told Moses to smite that rock. That was to hit it, hit the rock like that. You see, what happened to Jesus? Was Jesus smitten? Yes. In his life, 
was all of the curse and all of the things through all of Israel's history and all of the Old Testament wasn't it on him? Yes. It sure was. But God gave him something else. He's, the same thing happened again. And he told Moses to go speak to the rock. You see the difference? One was a physical act, but the other one was just an act of speech. One required a physical presence and a physical uh, take, type of taking energy. But the other one was just the obedience of the mouth. Speak to the rock. And that is what God wanted us to do. The first time that Moses received the commandment and he smote the rock, he was in obedience because Christ was very smitten. He was tortured to the place of only him being able to withstand it. But you see, that was a type of Christ, that rock, being smitten, being hit by mankind. But the second one was to speak to the rock and when Christ come in the image of a man in the form of a fleshly body with blood in his veins just like his fellow brethren and his fellow creation he was to speak Moses the second time uh, was supposed to speak to the rock but he didn't he went over and did it again that disobedience, God kept Moses from going into the promised land. He was forbidden to go to the promised land. And the only thing God allowed Moses to do at that situation was to go up on the mountain and to look over into the promised land. But as far as going down the mountain and walking to, to it and stepping in it, no, could not do it. We have been given a covenant. The Gentile people have been given, dis, distribu distributed by the Apostle Paul, a covenant of grace. That grace requires no physical work, no physical labor, no smiting of anything, no uh, effort on our part. We were given a covenant of grace through Paul. And it's not by works of the law. It's not by the exalting of Moses' law through the Jewish religion that we are accepted. We are now accepted by speaking to God in the form of saying, Lord, I believe you. I believe you died on that cross for me. That's it. Just you speak. Each person has to speak his individual salvation. I, I can't just go out here to a stranger and say, Lord, I speak salvation to this man or this woman. It's, uh -uh. It don't work that way. That's what they do. But that is what they want to hear. They mm. want to hear a, a mighty preacher standing behind the pulpit and uh, giving this type of uh, calling unto people that if you'll join this church and if you'll sign this book and if you'll be baptized by us and if you'll pay your tithes here and if you'll keep your Sabbaths here and if you'll work in our organization and do as we do and say as we say, you'll be saved. Right. You see? Wrong. Jesus did not require one physical, materialistic work. The only thing he requires is you to speak through your mouth and confess the Lord Jesus with this tongue. It's what Apostle Paul writes. Yep. Confess with your tongue and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and it says you shall be saved. saved. 
No ifs, ands, and buts. It doesn't say, and if, if you do confess Jesus Christ with your lips and call upon him and say, Lord, I uh, appreciate what you did on the cross for me and uh, you took my place and everything and then you go to church and you uh, begin to lift up works and say, now, Lord, I paid my tithes now, you know. Now, Lord, I done as best I could on the Sabbath day yesterday on Sunday. And you see the confusion that the physical, the natural brings into this? God does not want any type of physical, natural work to come from the effort of the believer. The work has already been done. So therefore, the effort was put forth by Christ. And we all, we have to do is believe it. Believe on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll be saved. So that's the purpose of Bible study to me. That's the purpose of all preaching is to make you understand what length, what great uh, pain the Bible, uh, Christ took that's recorded in the Bible by Paul. How far he went. I mean, you just couldn't go no further. He went the ultimate supreme sacrifice of himself. The creator became the sacrifice for the creation. That's the way this works out. The creator that made all things and mankind and all of the creation on this earth, the creator himself chose to suffer and die a painful, agonizing death in torment, in uh, the worst thing was he was stood there alone. Yeah, stood alone. You would think of three and a half years of walking under Judaism with his 12 apostles, with his own mother, with his own friends that he had made, Nicodemus that went to him by night and confessed, Joseph of Arimathea who can, who confessed to have the body and asked to have the body and took it to be buried. The friends that he made of Martha and Mary, Mary Magdalene uh, of Lazarus who was dead and he went to the tomb and called him out of it. The things that Jesus did uh, in a, an example of God. No man could have fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with three or four loaves of bread and two or three fishes? No. No man could have done it. No. His example that he set, uh, they should have been saying, no man's ever done this. This is no. God. This is God. You see, but no. It just, they could not confess it and believe, you see. Yeah. Even the blind man, Jesus healed us. That was an example. Been blind for 38 years at his youth from the time he was born. His own mother and father, they asked him, said, is this your son? And he said, yes, the father did. And the mother said, yes, he's our son. He said, but for this man, we don't know who he is. But that blind man knew. The one that Jesus healed, he knew. His profession is that yes, I was once blind. And he said, yeah, I couldn't see. He said, but now I do see. Yeah. And the reason I see is because of that man. But that Jesus man, still Jesus. stood alone. So you see, yeah. uh, the Lord done so many wonderful miracles in the sights of men, and they still could not believe. They still wouldn't just humble themselves and confess. You are our Messiah. Amen. You are our King that should come back here, what we read in prophecy. But no, they just wouldn't do it. They were scared. So anyway, yep. the book of the Bible is a complete, finished message. Back here, 
It began as prophecy. It began all the way through the 39 books of the Old Testament. And as it proceeded and come forth over the course of 4,000 years, that's how long it took uh, for all of these things to be set in order and the things that uh, Jesus was going to come into the world to do at the end of Malachi. It was 4,000 years of prophecy. 4,000 years of men put in these dispensations of time that would open their mouth and then they would speak things and then God would inspire them to write it down and he made the provision for to do that, to preserve the words. The book of Psalms, 150 chapters wrote by David, he took it upon himself to record all the things that he heard in his ear. That was God whispering in his ear. That's why you read the book of Psalms and it has so many deep things and many revelations and many prophecies. It's probably got 200 prophecies in it where Jesus has to come in his intervention himself and fulfill. He couldn't leave a one of these undone because he's only going to make one appearance. He's only going to come in the flesh one time. And he come to do and fulfill those things. And this is a progressive revelation. It was one revelation but it progressed here for 4,000 years and then it came into pass and came to be fulfilled as Christ was born of a woman made under the law to redeem them. All right, when it, he's under the law, he's lived in it for 33 and a half years and he has fulfilled every, what we know as tot or tittle. He's, he's fulfilled everything in the law there is to fulfill. There's nothing left. Why do people just keep looking and looking and looking and looking for something for God way out here not even seeing it to come? They can't accept the fact that he did come and that he did fulfill the law and that he did abolish it and he took it out of the Jews, his own people's way. He took it away out from off of their shoulders. But then turned to a people that he had never had any affiliation with at all. The Gentiles. He came to his own, first chapter of St. John's Gospel, he came unto his own, but they received him not. Uh, see, the world today is wanting to believe in a savior, but they're not seeing what he did for us as Gentiles as far as putting into perspective of what's required of us. The law demanded things from Israel. The law demanded killing sacrifices. The law demanded things that of eating and drinking and clothes that they could wear. And the law demanded a paying of tithes and keeping Sabbaths and seven other holy days and feast days. The law demanded it. But to the Gentile, there's not one demand like that. The Gentile is not demanded or commanded from God to keep a Sabbath day. The Gentile people who were at the time of Jesus were known as heathen. We were just known as beasts of the field. And we had no covenant with God. In other words, it wasn't prophesied that Jesus is going to come one day and fulfill the law, and then he's going to turn around and write another covenant to the house of, of the Gentiles. That, it's just, that's taking the Bible out of context. He did not come to take the law away from them and then punish them by taking it away and giving it to us. He did not give us any such commandments. Our commandments, you see, are not the things that Christ abolished in the law. 
He didn't wipe his blood off of the law and say, now I'm going to teach this to you Gentiles. That's not what he did. The scripture says in prophecy, Behold, I come and I do a new thing. Written in Isaiah chapter 43. He's going to do a brand new thing. And that new thing that he's talking about doing after he's fulfilling uh, the one that was in place, he is going to give it to his people whom he has formed for his own glory to praise him. That's what it says in Isaiah about chapter 43 along about, I don't know, 24 or 5. But anyway, the covenant, the new thing that he's going to do, he tells them in Isaiah 43. Let's just turn over here and read it. It's, it's some, it makes for some good reading. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 43. And I want to show you some wording here that is very important. Let's I start at Isaiah chapter 43 and I want to read verse 3 to you. It says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom and Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. What's he saying? I gave Egypt for your ransom. You know what he done? You remember what happened to Pharaoh and his whole army as they went out and tried to cross the Red Sea? They didn't make it. They got out in the middle of it and the walls of water fell in on them and drowned it, every one of them. All their horses and all of them soldiers. That was the ransom that God paid for the redemption of Israel in the desert. They had just walked through that same Red Sea on dry ground. Mm -hmm. They didn't go through fighting the sloppy mud and pulling their feet in and out and hard. They walked through on dry ground through the Red Sea. And when they got to the other side, Pharaoh and his army went into it and started after them and the walls of water fell in on them and drowned them all. That was the ransom here he's talking about. It cost a, a lot of lives that day, and all of them were unbelievers. Pharaoh was not trying to cross by faith the way that Israel did. When the sea opened up and Moses and God told Moses to go through the sea. They started through the Red Sea. Uh, it wasn't a narrow path. It wasn't a 10 foot wide, 20 foot wide path. I say the path was probably 400 yards wide. No telling how far wide the path was. Because there was a, a, up in the millions of Jews walking through that. And but the price and the ransom for them crossing it, walking by faith to the other side, was all of Pharaoh's army. And when that was all surrendered, when that was all compromised, their army was dead. They had no protection back in the city, you see, of, in, in, of the land of Egypt. So I, I don't know who came in and took it over, but I'm sure they lost their own inheritance. The, the Egyptians did. Right. But anyway, let's go on down. <clears throat> Verse 8. 43, 8. Isaiah. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes. Now, now wait a minute. See, we just read things and it just don't even make an impression on our, our heart. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf people that have ears. You see, God is speaking to them in a way that I have spoken unto you and you can't hear me. You won't hear me. You won't listen. He said the things I've done, blind, means that they have forget about all these ten miracles that 
Moses did yep. back here. And they forget about how that they was delivered from that Red Sea uh, disaster and from Pharaoh's army. You know, they forgot what they saw. All them plagues fall on Egypt, especially that last one, the plague of the killing of the firstborn, where the blood was not applied, but Israel had the blood, though their Passover lamb. So you see, when the Bible speaks, it's a lot of times it sounds like it's speaking in what Samson and what uh, Solomon would call like a riddle. It's like a thing that speaking that means one thing, but it's spoken in a thing that relates to and points to another. They weren't blind. With their eyes, it's their, their mind. Their eyes, hear. It's their mind. They couldn't see. They couldn't hear. How soon would they forget how God with a mighty hand delivered them? Within a couple hundred years, they're right back in idolatry. Within a couple hundred years of that mighty deliverance by Moses, four or five hundred years, they're right back into worshiping idols and graven images, picking up paganism and heathenism. Jeremiah talking chapter 10, verse uh, 10, chapter 10, verse 1 through 9, talking about the ways of the heathen that the Israelites is just picked up, caught on to. It's just like the devil has a, this uncontrolled hold to them, and he's not going to let go. They, they're not going to break loose from this idolatry and this uh, worshiping of idols and graven images and falling into the same place uh, that they had always been. So let's read on here. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us forming th former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is true. What he's saying, of all the signs and the times of past, the people that have witnessed these things, the people that saw firsthand, and what they, he is saying, let them be gathered so that they can either be a witness to my truth or let them be hear these things and say it is true. In other words, today, why don't God's people, God's elect, get together and make a stand and say we saw these things, we heard these things, we were witnesses, we saw and know the truth. Well, see, the only way that you can believe is through faith. You have to trust and believe what Paul writes back here. Mm -hmm. You put all of your hope, all of your trust in what Paul wrote as being the truth because he heard it from God in his ear and he writes it. Well, these people here, they, in an appearance, saw these things, but once they saw them, after a few months, a few forgot. years, they forgot it doesn't matter, yep. you see, because that